morning church we just want to say blessed Father's Day to all the fathers that is listening to this service and we pray that you'll be blessed this Sunday and to all of you we pray that you will also have a good time
and happy Sunday. Welcome to Church Online. Church is reopening soon. Given the time needed to prepare and put in place the standard SOP, Tabernacle of Praise will officially be reopening on Sunday, 5th July 2020. Attendees will have to meet certain requirements, but no worries, online services will still be available later in the day. Do refer to the weekly e-bulletin and more info will follow once the working committee has everything in place. Happy Father's Day! Here's wishing every dad, dad-to-be, spiritual daddies, granddads, great-granddads, a very happy Daddy's Day. Whoa, that was a lot of that. Happy Father's Day and may you enjoy this special Father's Day medley by the Creative Ministry. Daddy, you're my hero. You 
This Sunday is a special Sunday. And all of you know that uh, this Sunday is special is because it is Father's Day. And today's sermon is of course about fathers and fatherhood. And I want to begin by saying that fatherhood is a gift from God. And the concept and the idea of what fatherhood is all about must necessarily be drawn from its source, from God as our Heavenly Father. And Scripture tells us quite a fair bit about God as Father. And it is from Scripture that we can draw a certain idea of what it means to be father, the joy of being a father, and what fatherhood really should be like. I want to take a, a part of the Bible which speaks most about what the heart of a father should be like from the New Testament. Taking from uh, Luke chapter 15, verses uh, 11 to 32 the parable of the lost son. And in this parable of the lost son, we have a story told by Jesus. It's a story that tells about a son we call a prodigal son that was wayward. And this story involves three characters. The main character is the father, and then there is the character of the younger son. And uh, the third and last character is the character of the older brother. And this parable is set in the context given in Luke chapter 15 verses 1 and 2. And in both these verses, we have it recorded in verse 15, uh, in verse 1 of Luke chapter 15, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. That means to hear Jesus, verse 2. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law martyred. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. What was the complaint uh, that we can draw from uh, verse 2 of uh, Luke chapter 15? It's a complaint uh, that is an accusation uh, of the Pharisees that Jesus was actually uh, eating uh, with sinners, welcoming sinners. And uh, it is within this context that Jesus spoke about this parable of the lost son. And in these three characters, the first character that Jesus develops is the character of the younger son. Then after that, uh, Jesus goes to the character of the Father. And the last eight verses of Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32, Jesus talks about the older son. Today, I would like uh, to talk about the younger son and the father. And I will leave the character of the older son to another more opportune time. And the Verses read in this way. Verse 11 of Luke chapter 15. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. Verse 12, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Verse 14, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. Verse 15, so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pots that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. 
Verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. Verse 18, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Verse 19, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Verse 20, so he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Verse 23, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Verse 24, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now, looking at these 14 verses, the story begins with this man who had two sons, an older son and a younger son. And the, the story, it uh, comes on when the younger son demanded from, from the father a share of his inheritance saying to the father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Looking uh, at what the younger son did, we must understand that while his father was alive, and then uh, asking the father to give him his inheritance, to divide his estate, is dishonouring to the father. It shows a great disrespect to the father. It also shows that there is no real love for the father, that the son indeed has gone really, really wayward and rebellious. It must have really hurt the father to have a son coming to him demanding a share of the estate. On the other hand, from a legal point of view in Jewish law, it is legally not wrong for the son to ask his share of the inheritance. As a younger son, he would have got one third of the estate. And uh, for his older brother, a double portion, which would be two thirds of the estate. Then the story goes and scripture records in the parable, so he divided his property between them. The father in detail divided the property and gave it to the younger son. From here, if we want to look at the heart of the younger son, we would have to say that the younger son valued possessions more than he valued the father. Then verse 13 goes on that not long after that he went off to a place that is far away and he squandered all his wealth in wild living so you can see if he was squandering his wealth he must have actually been spending his time into pleasure seeking into uh, spending all his money to gratify himself and this is the second truth we can draw that the heart of the son is a heart where this younger son valued pleasure more than he valued relationship, more than he valued his father. So up until this point, you can see a picture of a young man who valued possessions and who valued pleasure more than he valued his father. Then uh, after he had spent everything then a severe famine struck the country and then he began to be in need. So he was forced 
to accept a job as a hired man. And uh, as a hired helper, he was asked to feed the pigs. To the Jews, it was uh, really uh, something which was really, really very, very bad. Because the Jews, they view pigs as unclean animals. And uh, he had to come to a point to feed the pigs. He had reached the bottom of his life. And uh, feeding the pigs was still not enough. Uh, at the downhill that he was going, the scripture goes on, the story goes on. He reached a point when he was so hungry that he was looking at what the pigs were eating and he was wondering if he could actually eat the pig's food. It was at that point that he came to his senses. Where in verse 17, you have this record, when he came to his senses. This is the turning point of the story. He had reached rock bottom. He had reached the part of his life where he was at his worst. And then he came to his senses. This is the turning point of the story. He began to realize. He began to realize the wrong that he had done. He began to realize the sin that he had committed when he dishonored his father by requesting for his share of the inheritance. He began to realize the errors of his ways in squandering all his wealth until at that point he had nothing left. And then, he said to himself, I will set up and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Now, until this point, we are not too sure whether real repentance had come upon him. It is because there is a difference between regret and repentance. The difference is this. When a person starts to acknowledge that what he is doing is not correct, when a person starts to acknowledge the error of his ways, when a person starts to acknowledge that he has sinned, it is still at a part of regret, which means, which means that the person is still at a point where he is regretting his actions, the things that he has done. Now, when does regret move to repentance? It will need to wait until verse uh, 20 when he says, So he got up and went to his father. He is acting on the, his regret that he got up and went to his father. That would be real repentance. So I want to draw this difference. When a person uh, things about the things that he's, he has done which are wrong, when a person uh, acknowledges uh, the errors of his ways, when a person acknowledges his sin, it is still at a point where we can say he, he is at the face of regret. But when the person starts to do something about it, that he wills to change, that he does not go back to his old ways, then, in that action, it reveals that he has reached real repentance. So verse 20 is the verse that tells us that this young man has reached real repentance. The story thus far gives us a picture of a sinner. The story thus far tells us that in the world where we are all in, all men and women descended from Adam and Eve, that the sin of Adam and Eve is passed on down to his generations, that indeed all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So in that sense, uh, all of us, uh, we have a sin nature in us. All of us, uh, we are born as sinners and all, need the forgiveness of our sins. For those of us who have accepted Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, we have obtained this forgiveness of sins and we have 
become a children of God. For many who have not yet accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior, then they still need the forgiveness of sins. So until this point, it describes the point of a sinner that has come to repentance, a point of a sinner that wants to come to a relationship with God the Father. And here is where we want to connect this Luke 15 with John chapter 14, verse 6. In John chapter 14, verse 6, you have John recording Jesus' answer, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So for the person to go back to the Heavenly Father in a favorable relationship, he has to go through Jesus because John 14 verse 6 says, no one can come to the Father except through Him. So in faith in Jesus, believing in Jesus, in the work of Jesus on the cross, it is Jesus who died and resurrected from the dead. It is the blood of Jesus that cleanses us of all sin. Then the person in accepting Jesus, in having faith in Jesus, in calling Jesus his Lord and his Savior, in repentance and faith, he begins a new relationship with God the Father as a son of God. Now, moving on, we want to look at how the Father responds. In verse 20, we, it's recorded that when the Son got up and went back to the Father, the Father was there waiting for him. Because the story goes, while he was still a long way off, the Father saw him and the Father was filled with compassion for him. The Father ran to the Son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. So you can see the Father must have been pining for him uh, day and night. That the Father must have gone to that place looking for the return of his son on a very regular basis. It gives us a picture of a father pining for the return of his son. And then when the son met the father, when the father hugged the son, kissed the son, the son tried to explain his unworthiness, tried to uh, tell the father that he had sinned against heaven, against him. But the father did not really take all that to heart because for the father, his heart is, has always been for the son. And what the father did was in the middle of the explanation of his son, the father told the servants to be quick to bring a, the best rope, put it on the son, to bring a ring and put it on the finger and to bring sandals to put it on the feet of his son. And then the servants were instructed to bring the fattened cow, killed it so that they can have a feast and to celebrate. Then we have verse 24, the father proclaiming, for the son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate what joy the father had to have a lost son being found again, to have a son which he considered dead alive again. This is the heart of the Heavenly Father, that the Heavenly Father desires that none should perish, that all sinners will come to know Him once again and to be able to get this right, obtain the right to be called children of God to be sons and daughters of God. That sonship is a blessing that they can receive in their salvation. This is the heart of the Father. That the heart of the Father is a heart of forgiveness, forgiving everything the Son did. In this parable, the story, you can see that the Father indeed forgave the Son for dishonoring Him, Forgive the son for asking for a share of his inheritance. Forgive the son for all his wayward ways. And beyond that, the father 
bestowed grace upon the son that beyond forgiveness, he actually blessed the son by giving back the sonship, the status of sonship to the son, giving the best that he had, the rope, the ring and the sandals and making a feast to celebrate his return. This is the goodness of the Father. This is the heart of the Heavenly Father for sinners. And it is this we want to pick up. For earthly fathers, this is also their heart. To fathers in tabernacle of praise, on this special day, on this Father's Day, I want to encourage all of you to grow in communion with God the Father. And in growing in communion with God the Father, I pray that all of you will grow in that forgiveness of God that you will indeed show to your children. That grace of God coming upon you that as a father, you will give undeserved favor to your children to bless them as much as you can. That as a father, you will take up the God-given responsibility to continue to provide and to protect for your children. That indeed, your heart will be a heart that is towards your children. On the other hand, to all the children in tabernacle praise, and I use the word children in terms of those of you who still have fathers who are still around, which means I'm talking about those of you who are in your early years, teenagers, young adults, even middle-aged people, those in their 50s or 60s. If your father is still around, you are still a son or a daughter. To all of you, children whose fathers are still around, that this Father's Day, this special day, remember the sacrifices that your father has made to indeed bring you up to adulthood, to provide for your education, indeed to sacrifice much of their life to make sure that you will indeed be able to lead a good and a blessed life. To all those children who appreciate that their fathers have led them into the things of God, who have been there as much a natural father as a spiritual father to them. To all those of you who are children, Remember your fathers well. Remember the sacrifices. Remember the forgiveness. Remember the grace. And today on this special day, shower them with your love. Shower them with your thanksgiving. Shower them with your appreciation. From the Old Testament, I would like to draw a father-son story to illustrate the heart of a father. And I'm taking it from 2 Samuel chapter 18. In 2 Samuel chapter 18, we have the story of King David and his son Absalom. And the story goes along this line that Absalom rebelled against King David, his father. And in that rebellion, uh, he was trying to capture King David and to kill him. So he plotted to kill King David, he had an army of men to go after King David to capture him, but he failed in his plot. And in time to come, King David assembled an army of his own. And both King David and his son Absalom, they had a decisive battle between two armies. Now, before King David sent his uh, uh, soldiers into the battlefield. King David indeed uh, reminded his commanders and his army, his soldiers, that they must 
remember to keep his son Absalom safe, not to take his life. Now along the way, the battle began, and in the heat of the battle, at the end of the day, his son Absalom was killed. Now, after the battle, two messengers were sent to inform King David of the news of the battle. At that particular time, uh, King David was at the gate of the city, waiting for news of the battle. From afar off, he saw one man running, and this man came along. And uh, when King David asked him, this man gave the news. He says it's good news that the battle had been won. But if you look at 2 Samuel chapter 18, King David was less interested in the news about the battle, in the outcome of the battle, for he was more interested in the safety of his son Absalom. And he asked the messenger, Is my son Absalom safe? Now the first messenger could not answer him. Then King David saw the second one coming and he waited. And as the second messenger came, the second messenger gave news of the battle. Again, King David asked, Is my son Absalom safe? And this time he received the bad news that his son Absalom had lost his life. 2 Samuel chapter 18 records the response of King David. King David cried out aloud, My son Absalom, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom. All in King David uttered eight my sons. My son, my son, my son, my son, eight times. Now, what we can learn from this story is this, this narrative is, if we look at the background, Absalom was not only a rebellious son, Absalom was a wicked son. Absalom not only dishonored David, Absalom reached a point when he wanted to kill his own father. But King David expressed what we have just learned from the parable of the lost son, from the account in Luke chapter 15, how did the father respond to the wayward son? King David had forgiven his son Absalom. King David had grace to show for his son. Most of all, the heart of King David was for his son. The welfare of his son superseded his kingdom. The safety of his son was more important than the victory that he obtained from the battle. This is the heart of a father. And uh, for all of us in Tabernacle of Praise, to all the fathers, I want to encourage you. One of the great blessings and great joys that God gives to us as fathers, to us with the gift of fatherhood, is a heart turned towards our children. And it is a blessing that we are given by God it's a blessing for us to appropriate that all of you have a heart for your children. We may sacrifice much for them, but in seeing each and every one of our children doing well in the arms of the Lord, we already have obtained our due reward. For all the children, once again, those of you in Tabernacle of Praise, whose fathers are still around, appreciate them and remember the sacrifices they have made for you. Have a heart too for your fathers.
And on this special day, on this Father's Day, whether it be today, or for some of you, you all may have done it yesterday, or it can be tomorrow, bring your Father out and celebrate. Celebrate the way the Father in the parable of Luke 15 celebrated when he said, My son who is dead is alive again. My son who is lost is found. In our case, take your father out for a good celebration and celebrate it this way, that my father who has sacrificed for me, today I want to celebrate, to remember his fatherhood, to remember his sacrifice and to remember his heart for me. I want to celebrate by giving thanks to God our Heavenly Father for giving me a Father who has always, always protected me and provided for me. Let us bow our heads as we commit this time to the Lord. Father, we thank you for the gift of fatherhood that you have given to all the fathers in Tabernacle of Praise. And today we pray, O oh Father, that you will continually shower them with the forgiveness and the grace and the love of God, so that they in turn can have the heart of a father towards their children, that they will indeed show forgiveness and grace and a compassion for each and every one of their children, a heart for their children, to sacrifice for them, to protect them and to provide for them. I also pray, O oh Father, for all the children, the sons and the daughters, that they will indeed remember all the sacrifices that the Father has made for them, that they will indeed appreciate all the good all the provision and the protection that their fathers have given and shown to them all these years. And today, I want to bring all of us in tabernacle of praise unto the throne of grace. And I pray for the grace and the blessing of God and the glory of God to come upon each and every one of us in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.